to share with you this concept. I'm very honored to be here with you this morning. So uh, I will focus on primary frozen shoulder and mainly the surgical techniques. Uh, this is my conflict of interest without any, any involvement in this talk. This talk uh, began uh, a few years ago at uh, the Isaac Shoulder Committee where uh, our leader, Eiji Itoi from Japan, who was the chairman of this committee, proposed a, a consensus meeting about this uh, topic, about the shoulder stiffness in Amsterdam. And uh, an amazing group of shoulder surgeons all around the world uh, uh, visit Amsterdam and we work three days uh, trying to get uh, a consensus about these uh, very important shoulder pro problems. Uh, we, the output of this meeting was uh, a book that we published with the, uh, Professor A.J. Itoi and, and a paper for the Arthroscopy Journal. Uh, we approach every, every part of the shoulder stiffness, but uh, primarily the, this disease called primary frozen shoulder or idiopathic adhesive capsulitis. So as, as you were very well known, is, uh, the incidence is 2 to 5% of the population, mainly in female. Uh, one in four uh, cases are bilateral and is strongly related with theropathy, diabetes, and British Isle genetics. Uh, the faces are freezing, frozen, and towing, and, and as you know, it's self-limiting behavior, and the recovery usually happens after six to two years. There are some people that uh, think that the, the disease lasts uh, up to five years. The, the main process of uh, inflammation is the thickening and contracture of the ligaments at the capsule, at the anterior, mainly and at the anterior capsule. The regular treatment is uh, non steroid and inflammatory drugs, physical therapy, range, range of motion exercises, cortisone shots. And with this kind of treatment, we get a success of about 60 to 90%. But after doing so, there are some patients that uh, are refractory to this kind of treatment. And, and after the cortisone shots or the oral cortisone and a very good physical therapy program, they are not doing well, and so uh, the other treatment options are joint dilatation, mobilization under general anesthesia, or arthroscopic capsular release. My focus today is to share with you the technique of uh, this arthroscopic capsular release, mainly indicated in these um, very difficult cases. Uh, we need to go to the anatomy at, uh, and uh, review the anatomy of the anterior shoulder where you can find four layers. The first one is the capsule and the glenohumeral ligaments. The second one is the subscapularis. The third, the coracohumeral ligament, which is the most important structure to be released during the uh, primary frozen shoulder. And uh, then comes the coracoid and the CA ligament, the coracoacromial ligament. But uh, this is a wonderful dissection of my friend Paul Golano. Uh, where you can see the coracohumeral ligament on the upper left. And this is the main target of any uh, capsular release. You can see it in the video and you can see in the picture uh, below. Uh, we did have uh, uh, many cadavers, atroscopy in cadavers to really know the anatomy of these uh, coracohumeral ligaments, which arises from the base of the coracoid and goes to the um, bicipital groove. Uh, this is the base of the coracoid. On the upper right is the trapezoid, and, and this is the coracohumeral ligament, which is the main structure that is very contracted and uh, is the key to free and, and release the, the shoulder. X-rays are important, uh, mainly to rain out, uh, lud, uh, rule out um, uh, calcified tendinitis our cancer. Uh, the MRI need to be done by very special radiologists. Uh, in the freezing stage, you can see some swelling of the capsule in the coronal, axial, or uh, sagittal views. But uh, then you can see uh, the collapse of the axillary pouch, as you can see the normal one on the upper left. 
and the two involvement in T2 and T1, when you have a, a primary frozen shoulder, you can see the collapse of the axillary pouch and the thickness, uh, uh, increase in the thickness of the um, IGHL, inferior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, also, the coronal plane, you can see the coracohumeral ligament in the sagittal plane, uh, excuse me, uh, with a thickness over three millimeters. So uh, the surgical indication, as I told you, is the fail of conservative treatment for at least six months uh, with less 50% uh, range of motion and pain in the, uh, in the pain scale more than five, fail at least two uh, steroid injections or fail another kind of treatment. Uh, with regards to the technique, it's one of the most successful um, arthroscopy techniques and, and you get the the most happy patients that you have in, in, in your uh, shoulder arthroscopy life. This is a female patient with the left shoulder. You can see the range of motion before surgery that is uh, almost none uh, internal rotation and almost none uh, external rotation. We perform the, the procedure with a interescalene block alone. This is uh, the lipstick sign all over the joint is a very characteristic the redness uh, of uh, the joint inside the joint and uh, at the beginning we use the the radio frequency device to open the rotator interval uh, we open the interval uh, above the subscapularis and I, i'll show you the layers that you need to be uh, aware of the first layer is the capsule and the uh, medial glenohumeral ligament. Uh, after releasing that, um, you are able to see uh, the coracohumeral ligament. Uh, this is a, a left shoulder, and the arthroscope is in the posterior portal, and the radio frequency device is at the anterior portal. We are between the subscapularis and the biceps tendon. Here you can see the coracohumeral ligaments. This structure is very strong and very retracted. So uh, uh, an essential part of the surgical technique is to uh, release this ligament uh, at the middle. Uh, after doing so, you can see the head of the humerus going down and you recover a great amount of ex external rotation. But you need to uh, know the anatomy and really release this uh, ligament that is uh, behind the, the coracoid tip. After releasing all this ligament, you will be able to see the coracoid tip. If you see the coracoid tip, as you can see there, uh, with the uh, CA ligament uh, above and the cojoint tendon below, you, you have already released the, the whole thing but you, you need to see the coracoid tip uh, uh, there. This is a coracoid, CA ligament on top, and the cojoint tendon now. So um, after this, uh, you, you can uh, check the external rotation. There are some uh, surgeons that release a little bit of the subscapularis. In my view, it's not necessary because as you can see in the video on the top right, we recover a lot of external rotation, or almost 90 degrees, just shooting for the CHL. We, we locate a switching stick at the anterior portal because all these shoulders are pretty stiff and it's not easy to get the, the approaches. And uh, we use a switching stick to put our scope on, on the anterior portal and then release the posterior capsule. There are some literature that, that think uh, and prove that perhaps to release the posterior capsule is not necessary. But uh, uh, with the loss of internal rotation, we think it's a good uh, maneuver. This is the subacromial space. Sometimes it's involved, sometimes not. But uh, you, you need to check the subacromial space and the CA ligament. At the end of the operation, you have a full range of motion. Uh, in external rotation and inter-abduction and uh, internal rotation as, as well. You can see there, 
And then uh, with the patient uh, awake, we, we show the patient the improvement. This is a, a very important because, as you know, there is a primary frozen shoulder personality. These patients are different than many others, and it's, uh, say, wow, the, that she's uh, very happy to have that uh, kind of range of motion. So uh, this is a, a very motivating uh, mobilization for physical therapy. Uh, after the, uh, the the operation, we put the patient in an oral cortisone plan for four weeks uh, and pregabalin to approach the neurologic uh, uh, influence in a, in the primary frozen shoulder. So, uh, regarding the mobilization under anesthesia alone, and compared with the atroscopic capsular release, the uh, mobilization under the anesthesia. It may have some humeral or glenoid fractures, labral tears, calf tears, dislocation, or maybe uh, uh, neurologic injuries are described in the mobilization under anesthesia alone. With the atroscopic capsular release, it allows a precise debridement of the involved structures, the CHL, as I told you, to recover full range of motion. The, the medium and long-term results uh, described by the literature are very good, there is uh, no recurrence. Uh, I think it's very important the post-operative plan with cortisone for the last, like, at least for four weeks. So for ending, I, I, I think the primary frozen shoulder syndrome is a uh, self-limiting disease, but is very long. At least in, in, the, uh, in, in Latin America, North America, and Europe, the patients uh, would like a quick and, and fast recovery. So the arthroscopic capsule release is a technique only for the patients that they are not doing well after six months of uh, the conservative treatment, but it's, uh, uh, it leads to a fast and long-lasting recovery. Uh, I would like to thank uh, AJ Toy and, and the shoulder committee uh, team uh, for this uh, presentation, and uh, we hope to see you in Boston in the ISACOS uh, Congress uh, in June and next year. Thank you.